All right, guys. So we are moving into our next part of the race unit where we're going to be looking at theories to interpret uh, race, um, racialization, and the impacts of race. Okay. So uh, today we're going to cover racial formations. And then next time we're going to cover intersectionality. These analytical frameworks are important for us to understand because it will help us, one, unpack what is race, how it is kind of evolved over time, and then what are its material effects. Next week, we are going to cover what is racism and look at systemic oppression on a much more um, uh, focused and broad level. So these theories will actually help us um, parse through that as a part of a process of race germinating from one historical point um, that I kind of talked about last time, which we'll revisit in a second. That looks like in terms of where we are today. Okay. So first, yeah, get our nifty slides up. Okay. So what we'll be covering today is race. We're going to revisit this and kind of ask some rhetorical questions to think about what this actually is in relationship to uh, what we've learned so far. The phases of race thinking, uh, the Omi and Wanat reading uh, kind of unpack these as a part of a historical trajectory. And as I've always mentioned, um, race is not something that is some, that comes individually, but is a part of a concerted effort by multiple forces to define human beings as different with an explicit purpose. Um, namely, it has been for economic exploitation. Um, this has been true of both um, uh, all, or it should be, this is true of all critical race theorists and thinkers from um, Chican Chicanx, Latinx studies, Asian American studies, um, or AAPI studies, Native American studies, and African American studies. When we think about the formation of race, it has been predominantly to um, uh, enshrine certain groups as different and less than, and in doing so, that is allowed for um, uh, individuals or communities or, or empires, for that matter, um, namely the British, Spanish, and Portuguese empires, to uh, you know colonize lands, um, eradicate indigenous peoples, and then obviously plant um, those populations with um, indentured servants, which were you know mostly the chattel slaves. This is now um, evolved in many ways into the larger system of racial difference that we see today, uh, where individuals from these um, disparate and historically marginalized communities, again, the, the four that we've kind of mentioned in the past, have different life outcomes compared to the dominant group, okay? Um, with that, we are gonna look at some racial prerequisite cases, and this is gonna help us um, understand the evolving understandings of race, okay? Uh, we're gonna cover racial formation theory, this idea of what's called racialization or um, taking a certain group of people and uh, ascribing them with a, uh, with a race or, or, or defining them by a, a racial uh, marker. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about race making, okay? This is all gonna be within this idea of, of one, what is race? How is it? Where does it come from? How has it evolved? And where we are today? Okay. The two key terms um, that I want us to focus on are racial formation theory. Okay. This stems out of sociology. The uh, authors of today's uh, chapter, or the authors of the chapter that you review, Michael Omi and Howard Wanat, first developed this um, as an analytical framework to think about uh, race, uh, socially constructed identity, and its importance as determined by social, political, and economic forces, okay? And this is gonna be very um, crucial, especially when we get into race making, as we look at how concerted parties from different aspects of society um, um, push or promulgate an idea of human difference, and then other individuals capitalize on that to pass laws and uh, or enact policies that um, one, either separate uh, communities or ensure that certain individuals uh, are not treated fairly or equally, okay? Uh, we will also be looking at racialization, and this is the process 
social understandings, I think stereotypes are used to classify individuals or groups within a black, white colored binary or continuum. Remember we talked about this with race last time and with ethnicity where what we've really seen is this understanding of whiteness and blackness is a part of a social construct and continuum where certain individuals depending on the political moment can or cannot be accepted. And I'll show a video example of this a little bit later that'll explain that more. An example I have quickly provided here is that we can see um, this being a good or bad thing, right? So Asians are good at math, although we don't necessarily know that all um, AAPI um, individuals are good at math or are good at other subjects, and that all immigrants are criminals, right? So these kinds of stereotypes are those that follow within this idea of racialization. We're ascribing characteristics of race to a certain community and therefore dehumanizing them, uh, presupposing that they uh, act and operate in certain ways, right? Um, what I want to know is that, again, this is a century long process. We talked about how this originated from either 1492 with the arrival of Columbus in the New World and his kind of contact with the Taino Indians, who he called, you know, Indians, um, even though they were the Taino peoples, um, and, or 1619 with the first arrival of African sl or slave ships with Africans, you know, from Africa, right? Um, notably with this, right? Uh, this is a social categorization that is ensuring that um, individuals can be exploited for capital gains or removed because they no longer serve a function in a capitalist society. Okay. Um, this is very important for us to think about, especially when we look at the long arc of racialization of certain communities. So again, first, um, you know, Columbus has contact with the natives. Um, he butchers them and, and enslaves them. Um, as you saw in the reading with Howard Zinn and John Iceland, eventually that became untenable because it's hard to en enslave people on their home turf. They know how to fight there. What they realized was that it was easier to in indentured servants and Africans. The problem with indentured servants is that they're indentured servants, so they can serve out their indenture and then become freed men. Because they're also white, it's harder for them to um, face the long uh, arc of mistreatment that is normally reserved for Africans that we saw at the time. And it was much easier and more profitable to just import a massive amount of Africans, mix them all up, spread them all over the United States and create this crazy chateau system that garnered billions and billions of dollars for the US. Um, and then that's where we have this kind of state today where we've seen this sense of anti-Blackness and this long arc of um, really uh, damning racism against uh, black folks. And then, you know, essentially all of the other communities of color face some kind of racism following a kind of anti-black framework. And I'll talk about that more when we get in into uh, this idea of anti-blackness when we get into African Amer or African Americans of the US. So first, let's go back. So race, right? What are our four or five primary race categories? Okay, so that's gonna be, again, Homo Americanus, Homo Africa, uh, Homo Afer, Homo, Amer uh, sorry, Homo Americanus, Homo Afer, Homo Asiaticus, and Homo Europaeus, right? So Homo Europaeus is being white, right? This, this European population. Um, Homo Afer is being black, right? From the continent of Africa. Homo Americanus being those from, you know, what we now consider to be the Americas. Uh, this reddish population, and then Homo Asiaticus, which is this yellow population, which is constituting most of the continent of Asia. We do have the in uh, or the inclusion of brown communities, particularly the Malays, but that Malay population is an interesting Aboriginal kind of nexus between various groups. Um, although many would argue that brown is mostly just this kind of mixture between. Um, Spanish, Spanish conquest, or I'm sorry, uh, Spanish conquistadors and other indigenous communities in Latin America. We don't really see that in North America with um, uh, English colonists and the natives here. Um, how, but primarily, we're still thinking about race within this either four or five categories of, of colorism, right? So white, black, yellow, red, brown, right? Um, these are considered to be what kind of a construct? Again, a social construct. And this is very important for us to remember because race is a social construct, right? It is not grounded in any scientific reality and nor is it grounded in any other type of 
historical tradition. Human beings were nomadic. They traveled all over the world. Um, the you know, we originated from the continent of Africa. There's tons and tons of evolutionary science that shows that we, you know, evolved essentially from monkeys. And I understand that that may be a hard pill to swallow or primates, right? Um, but where we are today and where we came from is still linked by that matter, right? So we all evolved into this hominid species that became Homo sapiens, you know, who we are today. And what we now understand as these categories of, you know, race and then also ethnicity because of culture um, is largely socially constructed, right? We developed these in our own human interactions. When did these understandings of race and racial difference emerge? Again, right, within the Enlightenment and colonial. So anywhere between the 1400s uh, or the 15th century up until <clears throat> the 18th century, we very much promulgated by European and um, US thinkers. And when we get into institutional or when we get into racism next week, we're gonna really dive into this where we look at folks like Samuel P. Morton um, and again, Carl Linnaeus who we've already reviewed um, and how they've thought of this idea of human dis difference and how that's been utilized um, to specifically uh, dis particular or specific, right? And then again, what is the primary purpose of establishing race and racial and ethnic difference? It is to create a social hierarchy, okay? And this social hierarchy, um, what it does for those on the bottom is it opens up for exploitation or allows those um, up top, those empower the dominant group to exploit that population. And although, again, we've had slavery um, throughout human society, um, the new type of that emerged in the colonial period was unique because there was a level of brutality that we would not seen previously. For the most part, there was a type of serfdom, you know, where you were able to operate with some level of rights and pay tribute to a monarch or some other kind of um, dynastic person. What happened in the colonial era um, was this type of uh, brutality against individuals where gold was the primary, you know, purpose of exploration and enslavement and trying to, and in doing so, there was a complete absence of humanity in the sense that um, we, you know, butchered people, um, beat them and worked them until they essentially, you know, died, right? Mm -hmm. So there are three particular phases that are covered in the text about this idea of race thinking, it at first emerges within this Christian and theological context, right? So there are two primary ways that race was talked about in this time. One was with this nice idea of polygenesis. So as European explorers started to move about the world, right, they would interact with these native peoples and see that there was a clear difference, right? Skin tone and culture. In this, right, they claim that all of these people from all over the world who look different than them actually came from a different um, species, right? That there was an Adam and Eve or something like that, that God had made it multiple human races, right? And this actually con contested the kind of book of Genesis um, uh, creationism narrative. I provided a, a um, early sketching of colonists arriving at the quote unquote new world trying to Christianize um, the natives above, right? And then what that, or what contested that with this was this idea of monogenesis, right? So the church argued that there was only one species of man, but that different races were at different levels of piety, right? And so this, this idea of godliness. So BIPOC um, groups were basically pagans and in need of rescuing and civilizing, right? This particular rationalization is important for us to hold on to because this justified the conquest of lands and the enslavement and eradication of people. Okay, I know I mentioned this um, in the race lecture, but I wanted to show it again here. This comes from John Osborne uh, in a global studies publication where he kind of outlines how the, um, the, po the political and power-based framework of Spanish, um, uh, peoples were during the um, the colonial era, right? So at the top, we have these arist aristocrats that were mostly Spaniards. They were considered to be peninsulares. There were criollos, uh, the descendants of these peninsulares. So these folks were born 
in America, but they were primarily, they were almost overwhelmingly Spaniard purebred by birth, right? And so they had a, a little less um, political and economic rights than the Peninsulares, the ones that actually came from Spain, um, but still far above um, others, right? You had mes uh, mestizos were a mixture of Caucasian and Indians, right? So they're just below that asterisk. Not too blackness, then, um, you know, then they're, they're, they have some more political power, right? This then gave way to um, this idea of biological science and social science. So uh, move towards the enlightenment period and we have more um, you know, academics and think critical thinkers emerge that are contesting the sense of the church. Um, they don't necessarily depart from the thinkings of race. Rather what they try to do is they try to scientize it, right? Or, or rationalize it within a science-based framework. So evolutionary biologists, botanists and medical scientists actually argue that human races were different down to a cellular level, right? That they were, um, uh, uh, had, you know, basically um, evolved right into, or came from completely different um, uh, species-based frameworks, right? And again, this gave rise to this kind of four types of man. And I'm gonna go a little bit more into this when we get into institutional racism, or when we get into, um, racism next week when we look at scientific racism. Um, but again, you know, another example of a textbook showing, you know, Caucasian, right, Mongol, uh, Mongolian, the Malay, uh, the American, and the African, right? Uh, and what I want to be very clear about, and the reason why it's important for us to think about this is that, one, the writers of these textbooks are white, right? And so they're, A, thinking about these ideas and then creating these ideas of human difference. This is not necessarily intrinsic to you know, any of these other groups. And there's been a lot of research and science showing that, you know, Africans were here in the Americas prior to the colonial conquest. Um, there actually were some Asians that made it this far out too. Um, and they had very peaceful um, coexistence and, and um, uh, peaceful um, interactions and coexistence. What is important to note is that it, it was mostly Europeans that one we're moving across these different borders, but also really working on trying to s differentiate each of these populations, right? Um, after that, we have the rise of social sciences, right? And so um, when Freud and Marx and Weber and Francis Boas are starting to try to um, understand human behavior um, within these kind of social or sociological frameworks, um, they argue that race was a social concept, right? That it was created out of social, historical, and political moments when various people were defined as different, right? And that's very important for us to think about because that's largely where we are today is that we, we do, for the most part, consider all of each other the same, right? We don't hold on to um, biases that say either God made us different or that we evolved differently. However, we do do a lot um, within these other political and legalistic frameworks to ensure that people are treated different. Maybe it's, or maybe not necessarily directly. I, I, there was a time we actually did that directly in the post reconstruction era up until the civil rights era. Um, but, you know, there are um, concerted uh, movements by, you know, various individuals to ensure that people are, are to, to pass laws that will um, ensure some people are treated differently, right? And we've seen this with anti-immigration laws, we've seen this with criminal justice laws, so on and so forth. What I've provided you here is a 
health bulletin um, from the from the Department of Health in Virginia, and it's uh, a uh, note talking about a law that was passed in 1924 to preserve racial integrity. And um, this is uh, kind of centered around the idea of anti-miscegenation laws or these laws that ensured that people of color could not marry, um, excuse me, could not marry um, uh, white folks essentially. And in doing so, uh, they would break the law, could be fined in prison, so on and so forth. I mentioned this previously that um, there was a Supreme Court case Virginia, where, um, you know, uh, a couple, this white husband and uh, African American woman had argued or had filed suit uh, against Virginia, that's where the loving versus Virginia comes from, you know, mentioning Virginia here, um, arguing, you know, that they were legally married, they were married in the North, that their, you know, their marriage was valid, they were attempting to confine uh, Miss Loving to a um to a segregated um, hotel suite because you know, you know they wouldn't allow her to cohabitate with her her white husband and that law uh or that case i'm sorry um brought about the end of miscegenation law for many many states in the united states had anti-miscegenation laws or had done a lot to ensure that um people of color did not um sexually and or romantically uh, mix with white folks And so this um, social understanding and legalistic understanding gave rise to a lot of cases that started to push um, the boundaries of what was white, okay? So whiteness has always been a kind of unstable category. Um, I've mentioned this in the past where uh, essentially who gets to be considered white and who doesn't changes over time. We saw this with the Italians when we saw that uh, small video clip from uh, Adam ruins everything where Italians were not being welcomed as such. And when they were, uh, when the narrative of Columbus was infused into their, uh, into the historical tearing, telling of the United States or the myth of the United States, they were seen as much more a part of this American based framework. Um, there have been others that have tried to make this case as well. What I provided you here on the right is a news clipping where uh, it talks about in, um, I'm sorry, in, uh, New York, in Buffalo, New York, a, uh, a grouping of three individuals had fought to be uh, or to be given citizenship uh, because they were Mexican, uh, but uh, effectively considered to be white um, because under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, and other uh, law, uh, Mexicans were considered white, but this judge actually denied um, these Mexican citizenship because of their Indian blood. And there was this understanding that Native Americans were not white and those with Native American ancestry would also not be considered white. So I'm gonna show this short video clip that will explain it a bit further with these two very important cases, Ozawa and Thin, um, that many folks reference when we're talking about the instability of race and, and whiteness. And then we're gonna actually go over some of these um, court cases. When we discuss whiteness in America, we often use the term Caucasian to refer to white people. Takeo Ozawa was a Japanese immigrant who fought to be recognized legally as white because at the time, naturalization laws required you to be either a free white person or an alien of African descent. His case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and ultimately, Supreme Court Justice George Sutherland ruled that white was a term that referred exclusively to the Caucasian race. But what does Caucasian even mean? The term Caucasian was coined by German philosopher Christoph Miners in his treatise, The Outline of History of Mankind. His work was wildly popular in of the scientific racism that I describe in my first video. Miners was a polygenist and believed that each race had different... In the 18th century, it was a common belief that beauty equated to perfection. So Miners' findings were based mostly on the level of attractiveness, according to him, of every racial group. 
He set up a racial hierarchy from least to most attractive and established two racial categorizations, the Caucasians and the Mongols. Caucasians were intelligent, cultured, morally sensitive, and attractive, while the Mongols encompassed every non-European group and were viewed as the complete opposite of the Caucasians. Miners compared and contrasted several physical features like hair and body type, but like most early racial theorists, he used skin tone as a way of determining supposed natural degrees of inferiority and superiority. At some point, he even suggested that Caucasians with darker skin were somehow part Mongol, though he revised this later, realizing that not all Caucasians have the benefit of staying inside all day and waxing poetic about racial superiority. Miners concluded that out of all European groups, the Germans were the most superior of them all. And as you can imagine, the German public ate it up. His work became heinously popular, and he went on to publish several more articles reinforcing his idea of racial hierarchies and the superiority of the Caucasian race. He'd often use physiology as a way of making a connection between the cultural and political power of people of color. In 1790, he published several articles in response to the slave uprising in the French colony of St. Dominic. And in these articles, he argued that not only was it impossible, but also simply unjust to give Negroes any modicum of equality, because as he put it, they were born inferior and predisposed to slavery. He often compared Negroes to animals and argued that they didn't feel humanity in the same way that their white Christian masters felt it. He stated that they were cowardly, unintelligent, easily irritable, promiscuous, and lazy creatures with insensitivities to beatings and torture. Miners were based in science, but he often twisted the work of scientists to confirm his bias. This got him a lot of critics from the scientific community, and one of his biggest critics was Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Blumenbach was a German physician, naturalist, philosopher, and psychologist. Unlike Miners, he argued that the human race was only separated by opportunity and all originated from one source. This, of course, coincided with the idea that all of humanity originated from Adam and Eve. He saw the gradation of humans across the world, but disagreed with Miners that these differences related to natural degrees of superiority or inferiority. He set out across the world seeking skulls from various regions to compare and contrast. By 1765, he had collected about 60 craniums, but his favorite was that of a Georgian female. He found this skull to be the most aesthetically pleasing because of its symmetry, its high forehead, its pronounced eye ridges, and Roman jawline. Because he found the Georgian skull to be the most beautiful, he concluded that all of human life must have originated from the Caucasus region. One of his now disproven arguments for that was that it was easier for a person with light skin to become darker than it is for a person with dark skin to become lighter. By 1795, Blumenbach had established five racial categorizations. The Caucasians, the Ethiopians, the Mongolians, the Americanoids, and the Malays. Blumenbach published his findings under the title The Natural Variety of Mankind. He went on to give more familiar terms to his five racial categorizations, and he officially deemed the Caucasian race as white. I know what you're asking. What does this all have to do with American racism? Well, both Miners and Blumenbach's work was popular in the late 19th to mid to late 20th century, and their findings were used to justify race-based discrimination in the United States. The definitions of many of their racial categorizations shifted as a result of racial prejudice. In 1870, Thomas Henry Huxley classified all populations of Asia of the mongoloid or yellow race. However, in 1920, Lothrop Stoddard stated that the brown race consisted of South and Central Asians. In the 1920s in the United States, the Naturalization Act of 1906 was still in action. And this act only allowed free white persons and aliens of African descent to naturalize. These narrow qualifications left many people racially ineligible for naturalization. And one of these people was a World War I veteran named Bhagat Singh Thin. Sindh was an Indian Sikh man who identified himself as a high caste Hindu of pure Indian blood. He immigrated to America in 1913 and found work in an Oregon lumber mill. Through his hard work and dedication, he was able to fund an education at the University of California, Berkeley. In 1917, he enlisted in the army and fought during the First World War. Unfortunately, though, he was honorably discharged in 1918. After fighting for the country he loved, he filed a petition for naturalization in 1920, and initially he was approved. However, the government canceled his naturalization when they discovered that he was a member of the 
Guitar Party. The Guitar Party was a North American Punjabi Indian organization that fought to secure India's independence from British colonial rule. Sindh did not deny his political activity and instead took a note from Takeo Ozawa and argued that because he was part of a high caste, that he could categorize himself as a free white person. He argued that his Aryan Indian language came from the Aryan part of India. Since his language was that of the conquering people, he argued that he could be categorized as white. Remember that since the Ozawa case, the term white had been a term that was defined as exclusively referring to people of the Caucasian race. But recently, Lothar Stoddard had defined people from those parts of Asia as brown. Finn cited Blumenbach and said that he had designated people from his birthplace as Caucasian. And he reiterated the fact that because of his high caste and his pure Indian blood, that he could be categorized as white, arguing that though castes often mixed, his high caste prevented that from happening in his bloodline. He also stated that he was repulsed by the idea of marrying an Indian woman of a lower race or an aboriginal Indian mongoloid. His lawyers argued that his disdain for inferior races furthermore categorized him as white. After hearing all of his arguments, Supreme Court Justice George Sutherland stated that Thin was not Caucasian in the common understanding of the term. Citing Encyclopedia Britannica's entry on Hinduism, Justice Sutherland argued that racial mixing did occur among the Aryan invaders of North India. And though caste systems were supposed to prevent this, they weren't entirely successful. Interestingly enough, though, the 1910 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica actually does describe the Aryan invaders of North India as part of the white race and made a point of saying that they maintained racial purity. Contradictions aside, ultimately, Thin was denied naturalization on the grounds that even though an argument could be made that he is technically Caucasian, it was unlikely that he was racially pure. Racial purity was, of course, encouraged because of the history of racial discrimination in the United States. In the 1920s, Darwinism and eugenics had started to influence the legal and social perception of non-white people in America. Charles Davenport was the head of the Eugenics Records Office in 1913. President Theodore Roosevelt wrote a letter to him praising his work in fighting to maintain Anglo-Saxon racial purity. An influx of non-white immigrants caused a fear among many Americans of a so-called racial suicide, where the white race would be canceled out by the rapid breeding of non-white people. Anti-miscegenation laws criminalize marriage and intimate relationships between white and non-white people. These laws trace back to the late 17th century in America in the 13 colonies. While anti-miscegenation laws were not national, the idea of maintaining racial purity and the threat of the negative outcome of interracial relationships did impact legislation across the country. In the Thin case, ultimately, they stated that the racial differences between Indians and white people were just too vastly different, and that white Americans would reject the idea of Indians assimilating into the white race. The Supreme Court's decision had major consequences for many Asian Indian immigrants. Many people had their land taken away from them and their citizenships rescinded. In California, the Alien Land Law of 1913, in conjunction with the Supreme Court's decision in the Thin case, empowered the Asiatic Exclusion League and their fight to revoke Indian land purchases. By 1940, about half of all Asian Indian immigrants had left the United States. In 1935, Congress passed the Nylea Act that allowed all World War I veterans to naturalize regardless of their race. In 1936, Thind finally became a citizen of the United States after his third attempt to naturalize. At the end of the day, Caucasian has very little to do with what we associate as white in America. Caucasians come from the Caucasus region, which includes modern day countries like Iran, Kurdistan, Armenia, and Georgia. While definitions of the Caucasus region are debated by those who live within them, one thing is clear. The people of the Caucasus region are diverse, and most of them look nothing like the blonde hair, blue-eyed people who we think of when we hear the term Caucasian. Looking at the thin case through contemporary eyes, the arguments seem silly, and the racial categorizations seem flimsy. But God seeing thin had to go to court to come up with every possible stretch of an argument in order to argue that he deserved to become a citizen of the country that he risked his life to defend. Historically speaking, America has used racial hierarchies as a way of who is and who isn't worthy of prosperity in this country. This country is built on the backs of slaves and immigrants at the behest and benefit of white men. And to this day, 
People of color have to fight to maintain their validity and how they measure up to white people who have historically rewritten history and twisted science to maintain their superiority. And that's white history. So again, when we're thinking about Kat's uh, argument here, right? One of the things that I think is very important is to really focus on this idea of white being unstable. Um, she mentions, you know, clear uh, scientific precedent that argued in, you know, encyclopedias that uh, folks from uh, Thin's region of, um, folks from Thin's region of uh, India were clearly white. Um, and despite that scientific knowledge and information, they still, uh, the Supreme Court, I'm sh I should say, still decided to rule that he was not white and not worthy of the um, And so when we go to our, sorry, we go here to our examples of this, right? So here is all of the cases, all 51 cases that for the Supreme Court trying to argue who was and wasn't white. So the first people to lob cases were Chinese. And I think what Japanese and Chinese folks argued at the time was, although yes, they were considered to be yellow, they didn't actually look yellow in their skin tone, right? Physically white. Um, and so if you look at some of the rationales for uh, denying these folks whiteness or, or as assuming whether or not they were white, right? Scientific evidence, common knowledge, congressional intent, try to deny Chinese as white. And that's really important because at the time of 1878 and 1890, which is around the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, there was a big push to remove many Chinese folks. And in these uh, court cases, what they were arguing is that, you know, you couldn't deport them because they were Chinese. They were actually physically white. And these cases said otherwise, right? Um, here in uh, 1889, we see Hawaiians is not as white. Um, and Hawaii is still in closer proximity to the U.S. and, you know, essentially an American colony at the time, um, but still not white, right? Japanese, not white. Obviously, this would make a lot of sense around the same time that we're trying to exclude Chinese, Japanese being very similar in cultural and ethnic garb, right? So we're still thinking of these folks within this yellow base framework, right? Here we can see Mexicans is not white, Native Americans is not white, right? No explanation, legal precedent. A lot of congressional intent and legal precedents in terms of the rationale here. Um, here in 1909, we start to see the rise of the Asian Indian cases, probably not white, or a Asian Indians are white, right? Uh, you know, there's ocular inspection of skin, uh, scientific evidence, otherwise, right? Uh, you know, so a lot of these cases are, you know, either are Indian or are white, not white, so on and so forth. Um, but one of the big pieces that we want to see through this is that this terrain of whiteness is super unstable, right? Um, although Asian Indians start to become white in the latter part of the early uh, 20th century, Syrians become not white, right? Filipinos as not white, even though Filipinos for the most part are mixed with Spaniards in the same way that Mexicans are, right? Because of Spanish colonization. Koreans is not white. Even, that would make sense we consider how um, Korea is a neighbor of Japan and, or it makes sense as Korea is a neighbor of Japan. And uh, again, now we see Armenians as being a part of life and as Afghanis not being a part of uh, being white, right? And again, coming from that Caucasoid region, that doesn't make sense. Arabians also from that Ca Caucasoid region, right? Common knowledge, legal precedent, not white. Um, uh, persons half white, half Japanese, one quarter Chinese is not white, um, persons three quarter Filipino, one quarter white, uh, you know, not white, right, all of this. So what this helps us really consider, and even here, right, German, so on and so forth, and the last case that's really arbitrary, and this one was very important um, uh, in terms of citizenship, is all of these cases are about who gets to be white and who gets not to be not white and who essentially gets to have citizenship. And in the framework of race in the US, 
um, and throughout most, most of the Western world, if you cannot be identified as American or white for that matter, and I would, I would conflate the two in this argument um, because of the implications here, when you are denied that citizenship, um, you're denied your humanity, right? You can't vote, you have no legal protections, um, there's no constitutional rights, so on and so forth. Constitutional rights are reserved for citizens, right? This is like a poli sci 101. If you're an undocumented immigrant and you are beaten by police, there's no uh, Fourth Amendment, you know, Fifth Amendment rights to due process or uh, protections from cruel and unusual punishment. You don't have um, rights to an attorney, so on and so forth, right? And there's been concerted effort by conservatives for many, many years um, to even deny, you know, basic social rights like healthcare, education, um, social services, so on and so forth. So in this case, right, so one of the things that we can suss out from this is that A, whiteness is very unstable and that all of these other groups are kind of um, evolving and including more or less folks uh, of non-whiteness, right, in their, in, their, um, in their groupings. And that inclusion in those, um, in those uh, non-white groups is opening them up to mistreatment, right? And that was clearly a Vincent Katz um, video when she mentions how many Indians were um, denied uh, their land or, or had their land uh, taken from them because of the, the Indian Land Act, right? Or the Indian land laws. Um, so we wanna be very clear that again, race evolving, unstable uh, and constantly changing depending on the historical and political context. So let's go back to our um, slides here. Um, so this gives rise to this idea of what's called racial formations theory, right? And this is what the whole um, kind of treatise of the article that you read for, for this session is about, right? So the theory of racial formations again, is an analytical tool developed by Michael Olney and Howard or not, which is used to look at race as a socially constructed identity, where, where the content and the importance of the racial categories are determined by social, political, and economic forces. There are several things that we want to consider with regard to race, right? So it is a social construct. As I mentioned, and as the information in the previous slide kind of shows us, it is unstable, right? It involves to include new groups over time, right? Um, both ways, right? Into whiteness and out of whiteness, right? So we've seen Irish and Italian and Jewish immigrants be considered white. We've seen Asian, uh, Mexican and other um, immigrant groups considered to be not white, right? Um, again, it's socially, politically and economically defined. And this is very important because if you don't have those political rights, right? You could be denied um, or you could be opened up for mistreatment or be vulnerable to mistreatment. While imaginary, it has material effects on people's lives. And this next video clip is really gonna show this in the wake of how we think about whiteness and um, uh, racism in the contemporary. Because if you know the history of the whole concept of whiteness, if you know the history of the whole concept of the white race, where it came from and for what reason, you know that it was a trick and it's worked brilliantly. See, prior to the mid to late 1600s in the colonies of what would become the United States, there was no such thing as the white race. Those of us of European descent did not refer to ourselves by that term really ever before then. In fact, in the old countries of Europe, we had spent most of our time killing each other. We didn't love each other. We weren't one big happy family. Side of my family that comes from Scotland, hell, they didn't even worry about fighting people outside of Scotland. Highlanders and lowlanders just fought the hell out of So there was no white race, but in the colonies of what would become the United States, what did we see in the 1660s, 1670s? We began to see that Africans of indentured servant status, many of them not enslaved yet, they were not necessarily permanently enslaved. Some were, others were indentured like many poor Europeans for periods of seven to 11 years. They could work off their indenture and then they would be free labor technically. Realized as did the white indentured servants, the Europeans who hadn't even been called white yet, that they had a lot of things in common like the fact that they were all getting their clock cleaned by the elite. And so they would get together more than our history books taught us. 
to foment rebellion against the elite to try to get a better deal for themselves on the basis of economic necessity and economic justice. And what did the elite do? When you see that you're outnumbered by black and white folks who are penniless, landless, peasants, you have to do one of two things. You either have to kill them all, but you can't do that because who's going to work? Rich folks weren't going to. They had to get poor people to work. Whole point was to be a person of leisure back in those days. That was the goal, was not to work. So you couldn't kill them all. You didn't want to kill them all. You had to do the work yourself. You had to build your own levy, build your own house. No, pick your own tobacco, harvest your own cotton. No, we're not going to do any of that. So you can't kill them, but you can co-opt them. And so the elite in Virginia, for example, in the colony, begins to give certain carrots to people of European descent saying things like, you know, we're going to let you own a little land, not much, but just a little. And we're going to get rid of indentured servitude. Now you're free labor. And by the way, once you're free labor, you get 50 acres of land just because you're free labor, see? So we're gonna cut you in on this deal. We're gonna let you enter into contracts. We're gonna let you testify in court. And here's the best of all, we're gonna put you on the slave patrol to keep those people in line, right? The idea was you're still gonna get your clock clean. We still don't like you. We still aren't gonna really empower you or change your economic subordination, but we're gonna make you honorary members of this team and you're gonna help us keep those other people down. And so they got a little taste of power and it did effectively divide and conquer those coalitions. Those rebellions began to stop almost instantly. Fast forward to the Civil War era. You have rich white folks in the South where I come from standing up and openly admitting that the reason they're prepared to secede from the Union and the only reason they ever articulated publicly ever was to maintain and extend slavery and white supremacy, not only where it already existed, but into the newly acquired, that is to say, stolen territories from Mexico to the West. That was what they said. Now we lie about it. We say it wasn't about slavery, but it was about states' rights. Yes, the right of the states to keep and maintain slaves, exactly. But back then they had no shame, so they didn't try and cover it up. They openly said it, but once again, the rich didn't want to go do the work. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, they're going to get poor people to go fight for them. And the poor folks didn't even own slaves. Now think, how do you get poor people who don't even own the shirt on their back? let alone slaves, to go fight to keep your slaves for you. You've got to convince them that their skin is more important than their economic interest. Because think about it, if I am a farmer who has to charge you a dollar a day or $2 a week to work on your farm and harvest that tobacco or pick that cotton, but you can get a black person to do it for free because you own them, who's going to get the job? not me. In other words, slavery actually undermined the wages and the wage base, the economic floor of the typical white working class or low income person. But they were told, if these people are free, they're going to take your job. No fool. They got your job. That's the point. And so at some level, again, working class white people being harmed by white privilege, relatively being advantaged, right? Being given a leg up, being given a membership to the club, but in absolute terms, being kept economically subordinated by the very thing that gave them a sense of superiority. How's that for irony? Then in the present era, this hasn't stopped. This is not ancient history. Now we have people running around insisting that we should close the border with Mexico because if we don't, the wages of working class people will continue to fall. The implication being that the only reason workers are paid like crap in this country is because the border is open. But if you believe that, you would actually have to believe that if that border were closed, that all these owners of capital and industry would just say, oh, well, you figured us out here. It's a raise. Do we really believe that the only thing keeping bosses from paying people more is the presence of low wage, medium semi-skilled labor from south of this artificial border? Is that really what we believe we know? That if that border is closed, it isn't going to be closed to capital. It isn't gonna be closed to goods. If you have a border that can be crossed by capital looking for the highest return on investment or goods looking for the highest price, but labor is chained to its country of origin, how is that going to work to the benefit of working people? By definition, it doesn't. By definition, it immiserates the working class. Divide and conquer. But the best example of all, perhaps, in the contemporary era, in the greater New Orleans area after Katrina, here you have two communities that were the most hard hit. Lower Ninth Ward, mostly Black community, 94% African American, about 40% official poverty rate, heavy working class community. 
And right across the canal, St. Bernard Parish, Chalmette, 95% white, also working class, high levels of poverty, economically very similar. And at the end of the day, in those first few days of September 2005, more similar than they probably would have realized. Because when those levees broke, they all got their stuff jacked. They all got their stuff destroyed. But if you had asked white folks in Chalmette, and I've done it, who was the cause of the problems in the greater New Orleans area prior to that flooding, they would have pointed across that canal at those black folks, wouldn't have called them black folks, and would have said there. That's the problem. 70% of the white folks in St. Bernard Parish voted for David Duke, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, former head of the largest Ku Klux Klan group in the United States when he ran for governor in 1991. Seven out of 10 gladly voted for him because he was blaming black folks for all of their problems and they bought it. What's the irony? The irony is that while they were blaming black people for their problems, while they were blaming black people for the conditions of the greater New Orleans area in which they lived, nobody was paying attention, least of all they, to the fact that these white elite politicians, either in Baton Rouge or in Washington, whose job it was to secure those levies, to make sure that levy funds were spent in the proper way and that they were spent at all, those mostly white and mostly elite politicians did nothing. At the end of the day, it wasn't just the black folks in the lower ninth ward they didn't care about. They really couldn't have given a rat's ass about those poor and working class white folks either. And yet, when the people of Chalmette, people of St. Bernard Parish got back into session, first time they had a city council meeting, parish council meeting after the flooding, the lights aren't even on yet. The water isn't even hooked up. And the first order of business was to pass an ordinance saying that you couldn't rent property in St. Bernard Parish to anyone who wasn't a blood relative. Now, I'll leave it to your imagination as to why you'd want to pass a law. That law had never existed before. But now that it's been emptied out and you don't know who might come back, that's a damn good way to keep black people out, isn't it? Because if you're 95% white to begin with, if you pass an ordinance that says that, that's a great, well, you can't say no blacks need apply. You can't say no blacks allow, but that was an ingenious way to get around the law. Now they got caught. There was a lawsuit threatened and they got rid of the ordinance. But my point in bringing it up is to say, once again, divide and conquer is working. These white folks in Chalmette need to march across that canal and join hands with the black folks who've been sitting there more than willing to work with them for an awful long time and march on Baton Rouge and march on DC and march on the Corps of Engineers and recognize their commonality of interest. But the whiteness and the lure of whiteness has tricked these have nothing in their bank account white people into believing that they got more in common with the rich white folks on St. Charles Avenue that didn't lose anything in that flooding than they have in common with the black working class folks who live about 500 yards away. So the reason why I bring up Tim Lies's argument here is to again show A, that race was unstable, right? We'd seen in the past white and black folks working together, um, speci you know, specifically to kind of, uh, uh, fight for better economic conditions um, and this creation of race and this creation of a white category um, lured individuals in to um, supporting whiteness. And we'll, we'll talk about this more um, next week when we cover the possessive investment of whiteness by George Lipsitz um, and, you know, fractured these communities, right? And then um, this had ripple effects over time, right? Where we had folks being anti-immigrant, for example, and also, you know, being indirectly and directly racist in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, right? Uh, and this is where I want to be very clear that it does have these immaterial effects on people's lives, right? These systems of race and racism um, lead to the disenfranchisement of people of color and poor whites for that matter. And, and one of the things I think is lost in a kind of apologist way, in an American exceptionalist way of trying to dance around racism is rather than um, openly confronting it, we say it doesn't happen. And now what we are seeing is that poor whites are more and more being affected by the system of racism because they're not like those elite whites, right? Um, we see this all the time in the criminal justice system, um, meth and heroin, uh, um, addiction rates and, and um, kind of epidemics have led to many poor whites being incarcerated in the mass incarceration system, although still predominantly people of color, right? And so that has, again, led to these material effects that are leading to these disparate outcomes. So this gives rise to this idea of racialization. And this is where I wanna be very clear that race, again, is fictive and imaginary, but 
uh, gets created by social forces and then ascribed to certain people. So the theory or the process of racialization is one where social understandings are used to again classify individuals or groups of people within that black white color binary or continuum, right? Can be good or bad. The example I used earlier when we were visiting here is Asians are good at math and all immigrants are criminals, right? This is essentially just a long process, right? Again, 1619, 1492, right? You know, roughly about uh, 120 years worth of difference, right? But uh, following mostly on those physical markers, and that could we can go back to Kat's um, analogy with those various um, Enlightenment thinkers and eugenicists who are really thinking about race and colorism as a part of this human difference, right? And so what this enabled essentially was this exploitation for capitalist gains, uh, that be slavery, whether that be other forms of uh, of forced indentured servitude, all of that, right? And they were, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, folks were removed because they no longer for, uh, served a function uh, in the capitalist society. And that's also very keen. And I think that's where we are today with our system of mass incarceration and deportation, right? We're always needing labor, uh, laborers, right? And mostly those laborers have been, you know, poor folks or people of color and or poor people of color. And as they become, you know, less and less important due to globalization and because of automation, we've had, you know, a variety of people who are no longer able to work, right? Uh, and we're not providing them the educational opportunities, college, uh, so on and so forth to get those high skill jobs what ends up happening, right, is we have to do something with them. They become a quote problem. Therefore, we incarcerate them, right? We create a variety of laws um, that criminalize their behavior, vagrancy, jaywalking, drug usage, so on and so forth, that ensures that they're out, you know, they're out of there, right? And and this is at the same time that, you know, we see ubiquitous um, drug usage, um, you know, and other types of cr crime rates or cr criminal activity across race and class groupings. However, the predominant group that is incarcerated, right, is always people of color. One thing that we have to understand with racialization is that all groups are racialized in relational and oppositional ways, right? So whenever a group comes into a new, uh, or two groups come into contact with, with one another, right? So it's in this relationality, they understand themselves as human beings, but obviously within opposition to one each other, or one another, right? One is, uh, you know, brown and the other one is white. The other one is brown. The other one is black. The other one is black. The other one is white, right? And they're, they're seen or, or uh, racialized in a way that is made to make them seem different, but different in this very oppositional way. Here we can see some examples of racialization of Latinx communities. And I wanted to show this kind of historically over time. Um, here on the left from the Fullerton Daily News, we can see a Mexican peon immigrant. Peonage comes from a medieval term of serfdom. Uh, peons are usually considered to be kind of like backwards and, and dumb for that uh, matter. And you can see him kind of carrying the sack of ignorance. And he's kind of traversing the border. He looks very poor, you know, doesn't have any shoes, right? And he's just kind of waltzing across the US. Here we can see a zoot suitor that's considered to be a draft dodger. Um, he's uh, kind of deferring his his duty to serve in World War II. And then lastly, we see this um, kind of different or this um, different kind of understanding of, of undocumented immigrants, right? So on the left, you know, we need help wanted cheap disposable labor, this kind of um, undocumented farm worker, right? And then at the same time, ICE is also looking for them um, to deport them, right? And so um, there are always kind of seen as less than, backwards, right, uh, or not a part of this American framework. And um, it, it, even though the, the stereotype itself is not necessarily the same, the negative connotation still is there and uh, current over time. And so this leads me to this understanding of race making, right? And so in the United States and throughout most of the Western world, we have done a lot to continuously rake, make and remake race. And so I've provided this kind of model here where I've broken it down into three categories. So race usually starts or the, or the origins of race thinking comes from the social. It comes from education and theology. And if you remember, right, Christian churches or Christian leaders and scientific leaders, right, both in 
the church and in, in academics or in education started to promulgate these ideas of human difference, right? Media then uh, pushes that out, right? They publish news sources, they cover this, so on and so forth, um, you know, expounding on these ideas from these academics who are saying this is different. This is then taken up by politicians that run campaigns or, you know, or take, it's taken up in the political field where politicians and campaigns push these ideas of human difference to essentially then pass laws and policies and practices, right? And this is very key because if we can get to the legal phase, so if we go from the social political to the legal, if this gets uh, codified, so for example, anti-immigrant laws, um, laws on drug use, right, whatever that looks like, these social uh, thinkers of the, uh, the social creators of race then um, are justified, right? Because then they can say, look, my theories about undocumented immigrants taken up by Trump uh, in an effort to pass these anti-immigrant laws are sound, right? And then I am justified and rationalized in my thinking. I'm going to show one last video clip to kind of uh, um, seal this off uh, that really, I think, shows how we've seen this come together. So in the 1990s, oh, In the 1990s, there was a big uh, push for um, um, anti-immigration laws. And Pete Wilson, the governor at the time before Gray Davis in the height of our recall election, um, really tried to double down on this idea of anti-immigration. So look at the, the language in here. And I think we'll really, again, evince with the points that I'm mentioning between media, politician, and law. They keep coming. Two million illegal immigrants in California. The federal government won't stop them at the border, yet requires us to pay billions to take care of them. Governor Pete Wilson sent the National Guard to help the Border Patrol. But that's not all. For Californians who work hard, pay taxes, and obey the laws, I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. And I'm working to deny state services to illegal immigrants. Enough is enough. Governor Pete Wilson. Yeah. And so it's how most of us got here. It's how this country was built. American citizenship is a treasure beyond measure. But now the rules. What we see in this video example, again, is this idea of, you know, a uh, number of immigrants, quote unquote, crossing the border where they get this information from coming from either a media or academic source. Um, this being, you know, uh, used by a politician, right, to run his campaign for reelection. Um, and he actually effectively utilized this to run his um, or to win re-election uh, for two terms um, in a way that, you know, again, codified these types of law. And then he ended up actually passing this Prop 187. It was defeated in, by the Supreme Court um, due to a lawsuit, um, but very they key keep in, coming. Sorry, two in how we think about this nexus of race making. And what I want to say is that obviously he's mentioning undocumented immigrants here, but who gets to be an immigrant, who gets to be American, if we go back to the Zawa Thin case, is very much uh, uh, front and center in this type of example where, again, who is here, who is not, is all determined by those in power, right? In, in this sense, the politician. So, oh, sorry. So with that, we've seen, you know, what is race? We've revisited that. We've talked about the phases of race thinking, Christian, theological, biological, scientific, and social science those racial prerequisite cases, racial formation theory, racialization and race making. And again, our key terms for this lecture were racial formation theory and racialization. And then the, you will see racialization come up in your first um, reading reaction paper where you'll actually give me a definition of this along with race. So with that, I look forward to uh, our next conversation about um, intersectionality. And if you have any questions, feel free to email.